Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Newtown Township Planning Commission meeting. Um, hello, can you do the roll call? Mr. Guy? Here. Ms. McGowan? Here. Mr. Evans? Here. Mr. Weiner? Here. Mr. Winterhalter? Here. Mr. Edwards? Not yet. And Mr. Silva indicated he would be absent this evening. Okay. Uh, we do the moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have the agenda uh, for this evening. Uh, does anybody have any comment on the agenda of last month? It wasn't here. Uh, yes, sir. Please say your name and address. Uh, Louis Rosenthal, 20 Harrison Drive. I have a comment on agenda item 7.2. Um, I can make it now. I don't not. Well, we will get there. Uh, this is just about the last month's agenda. Uh, minutes, I'm sorry. But okay. You'll get your chance to. Uh, to oh, I'm talk. sorry, I thought we were on agenda item five. I apologize. If you don't mind waiting until we get there. Uh, hey, any motion to approve? The minutes of, uh, oh, the, sorry, the agenda for this evening. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. Everybody, before I say aye. 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 I'll uh, abstain. I was not at the meeting. Well, this is just the agenda. No, this is for this tonight. Oh, no, we approved the agenda. I thought well, we were approving the, the minutes. Uh, my mistake, sorry. <laughs> All right, then. Um, then now we are talking about the agenda of last month. Yeah, the minutes. Uh, the minutes of, sorry. <laughs> the minutes of the uh, last month planning commission meeting. And this is item number six, 6.1. Mr. You... Chairman, I'll move for the uh, approval of the minutes of our meeting from February the 23rd, 2023. Second. I, I'll second. Second. You. Uh, okay. So we'll motion accepted. Uh, now we go to uh, plan review uh, item number seven, and we start with seven point one, uh, the Oniming uh, Golf Club, and this is, I understand, for the conditional use. Correct. Uh it's for the, uh, we're, as you may recall, the, it's, we're looking still for a recommendation for the plan and and also a recommendation to the board of supervisors as to the conditional use. So is it two applications or one application for, for you now? Well, there's an application for land development. And right. then uh, we appeared before you in November to review the plan. And then again in January, <clears throat> when we appeared before you in January, we had a review letter from the township engineer, which called out the need for a conditional use approval for the steep slope disturbance in connection with the stormwater basin that's downhill from the proposed new pool. The, when we made the application, uh, our engineer had interpreted the ordinance such that conditional use approval was not required. So we, consultation with the township engineer agreed that it was appropriate and that we would need to make the application. When we were here before you in January, we had not yet made the application. So what we agreed to do was come back, hoping that at one time we could get a recommendation on the preliminary final plan. And then we or had a little uh, discussion tonight with Brett who will review again with you the stormwater uh, location and the need for the condition for the steep slope disturbance. Sounds good. All right, Mr. Guy, on the agenda items here, yes. what about number five? In the minutes, we went back to the yeah. agenda, then you went ahead. 
this public comment. I thought it was a good thing. All right. Uh, was that a public it? comment on the previous minute, the previous agenda from the previous meeting? This is for number five, is for this agenda. For this agenda. Do you mind holding for more? Okay. So, my mistake. I don't know who went first. But that was about this. There will be a chance for the audience to speak about this subject of autonomy, right? This is right. what he was. So we are still on it. So, so okay. he will have a chance. No problem. Okay, I'll give you a chance, but not right now. Oh, no, normally, right. normally what we do in our proceedings is we allow the applicant to present his case, and then we invite public comment on what the applicant has presented okay. or any concern. So what we do is... Item number five. Right. I, no, I, that is for the schedule, for, for the items on the agenda not specifically on the subject. We, you will get your chance. Sure. Public comment in which you will speak is listed on the agenda as item number 11. Okay. Although that will move because as uh, my colleague said, after the applicant presents his case, you'll have the opportunity to comment. I can assure you, you'll get your chance. All right, Mr. D'Amico, please. Thank you. So again, uh, Mark Demeco representing Aronman Golf Club with me tonight, uh, Brett McKay, who's a project civil engineer, um, uh, Bill Barry, who's president of Aronman Golf Club, Andrew Whitelaw, who's the general manager of Aronman Golf Club, and Sarah Leon, who's the uh, representative uh, assisting the club with the construction projects. Uh, so again, just to uh, remind you the applicant the app this application was filed in uh, October of last year we appeared before you at the November planning commission in 2022 we did receive a county planning commission review recommending approval in December 2022 received the first township uh, review letter uh, in December of 2022 as well we attended the uh, planning commission meeting in January and again, at that time, we had not made the conditional use application, so we agreed that we would take a step back, make the application, and that would also give us time to resubmit the plans to address the issues raised in the December Township Engineer Review Letter. We've done all that specifically last month. We uh, filed the conditional use application. That hearing is, <clears throat> excuse me, tentatively scheduled before the Board of Supervisors next month. On March 7th, the land development plan were resubmitted by Chester Valley Engineer. Um, and then March 17th, Eric Johnson, uh, Pannoni Engineers, issued its second review letter. Um, if you may recall, both in the November meeting and the January meeting, a gentleman named Alex Skukas at 33 Dunmitting Road had appeared and had some, we had some dialogue with him about concerns he had with stormwater. We uh, committed to the Planning Commission and the Township staff that we would uh, interact with him. And specifically, Brett McKay has gone back and forth with him in phone calls and emails. And I think you may all have uh, uh, Alex's email uh, to the Township this morning, essentially saying he wasn't going to be here, but he expressed that he was satisfied with the dialogue that he's had uh, with Mr. McKay. So, and again, as a reminder, this planning commission uh, approved phase one, which is the golf learning center and the renovations to the golf patio. And uh, pleased to report that that uh, project is uh, well underway as we speak. Um, and back to this application, we do have a uh, review letter from Carl Keene, the township fire marshal, which is essentially uh, no comments and we're able to comply with all those we also have a township review letter by Rockwell Associates and again, minor comments and will comply. And uh, as to Mr. Johnson's letter, it's essentially a will comply. I'll let uh, Brett McKay speak to that and answer any questions you have about that. So uh, with that as background, our, we would propose to have Brett just review a couple changes to the plan since you last saw it in January. Um, then we'll do... <laughs> take your direction as to whether you want to go through the review letter item by item or whether there's anything that Mr. Johnson wants to just highlight. But again, it's essentially will comply. And then uh, since we are seeking conditional use approval and we'd like your recommendation for that, we're gonna have Brett just uh, 
go go back and go through the uh, the need for the where that steep slope disturbance occurs and the need for the for the uh, for the disturbance of that area on a temporary basis. That satisfies the plan. May I ask? Uh, you said that there are a few uh, changes to the plan. Yes. Are these changes in order to satisfy the recommendations by the township engineer and the bar marshal? Uh, uh, yes. Or in addition, are there other reasons for those changes? Well, I think may the probably the main highlight is we have a landscape plan along St. David's Road that uh, we're going to have Brett just spend a minute with you on, and then um, I'm not really sure there's much else, but I'll let I'll let Brett speak to that. All right. Okay. Thank All you. right, Brett. It's next to last. I guess just real quick to, to go over it verbally, um, what we did was in response to some of the concerns about the uh, removal of some of the, or the lack, I guess, of understory growth along between the Racket Center and St. David's Road as part of our tree replacement program, we augmented that with additional trees, evergreen trees, uh, and shrubs as part of the- Can you uh, speak up a little? Oh, sorry. sure, yeah, sorry. Um, Thank you. So we, we, we augmented the uh, the existing landscaping that's out there with uh, replacement trees that were required to provide, um, evergreen trees and uh, evergreen and deciduous shrubs, uh, just to sort of, again, reestablish some of that understory, which uh, appears to be missing right now in that, that wooded area. So um, let's say that was, that's what we did. I was, you know, if we can find the plan, I'll, I'll show you what we did. But, um, and it was reviewed by the township arborist and, and he's, he feels that it was, was adequate. Okay. All right. So, so these trees will be between the um, the racket center and the road. Correct. And it looks like there's going to be, I don't know, eight, ten trees, and they're identified as can canopy trees. So, mm -hmm. there, Well, there should be canopy trees, there are evergreen trees, and there are shrubs all, all proposed out there. And we've kind of interwoven them around the existing trees that are there. And you added those per uh, the recommendations of the Arboys, right? Mm -hmm. The um, recommendation of the Environmental Advisory Council regarding uh, 
different types of grasses. Has that been taken into account at all? Um, well, we just got that comment when we, you know, saw the EAC comments. But I, it, we either, I think the area that they're concerned about is the area that is below our relocated cart path. And we certainly can put um, taller grasses in there. The club uses that in, in places around the, the course already. Um, and certainly, you know, the other thing we're going to do is claim that as a no mow area. So over time, that area will grow back up and reestablish itself. So I, I don't think the, the club really has any desire to mow anything more than they absolutely have to. And that certainly would, would go down, you know, below the, below the cart path and certainly isn't going to do anybody any good as turf grass. So what kind of vegetation will you uh, put there right at the beginning? It would be a, a, a tall fescue um, that we would uh, plant instead of like the standard ryegrass, turf grass kind of things that we would normally use. Um, but again, over time, eventually uh, it would self seed itself with, with other species, whatever, and, uh, and basically reestablish sort of that uh, woodland edge situation that's, that's there now. Okay. Oh, here we go. Thanks, Heather. Um, we we do have the landscape, and as you can see, we've, we've taken uh, the replace some of the replacement trees that we need to do, and we've sort of interwoven the big circles that are up there. The smaller circles are the evergreen trees, and then you can see. Um, here we go. We've got you know low, uh, actually taller shrubs. Um, to try to reestablish some of that understory growth that we're uh, that, that, that's missing out there and help to screen that area from uh, from St. David's Road. Now, St. David Road, is it higher or lower in that location? In this location, I, I think right about here, St. David's Road starts to go down. So this is actually probably a higher elevation than St. David's Road is at that point. So if there is runoff from that area toward uh, St. David's Road. How how is the ground protected against that? Pardon, I didn't didn't hear the question. How's the ground oh, protected? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Um, well, basically, what we're doing is we're collecting the stormwater. And actually, this kind of kind of shows one of the other changes we did. We had, previously that's one of the new paddle ball courts, and the three padel courts are here. Uh, we had a system to, to control stormwater up in here and a system to control stormwater down in here. Um, the utility survey came back and we have utilities running through there, so we couldn't do that. Uh, and we felt that, you know, if we could move this actually down there, so that's now where the um, where the new stormwater system right, is. I understand. But if the ground, the disturbed ground is higher than the adjacent property, in this case, in the direction of St. David's Road, well, uh, how how is the ground, how is the soil protected in the long run against erosion uh, if you're not uh, providing any protection there? Uh, uh, unless I misunderstood you. It slopes that way. Yeah. So I actually, if we look, if you look at plan sheet three of 27, I'm actually looking, it has the contours on there. The property is actually sloping from St. David's East. Towards uh, their yeah, proposed stormwater basin. I, this one works right here. And it's hard to see the contours. Mm -hmm. As Eric says, the, the slope is actually flowing down this way. So the, the water never gets to St. David's Road. But I, I, I thought you were talking about a visual sense, but um, there is a the low point is actually running right basically right through there. All right. As long as it doesn't have all Yeah, I, so from what he's saying, uh, I can see from the visual perspective, what he was saying is you're kind of looking at that, but the slope. As far as stormwater is going to be concerned, is going from St. David's across right to where they have their stormwater no, basin. No, no, no. Oh, thank you. So, in addition to the trees and the landscaping, do you have anything else to present tonight? Um, not well. Let's say the 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 whole plan set was revised, addressing uh, the comments that we'd had from township engineer. I don't think there was anything significant. Um, looking through the engineers' comments, most of them I think are, are technical in nature. 
Um, and I think we can certainly work through those comments with the township engineer. Okay, well, you're asking for preliminary and final approval tonight, or at least a recommendation for that. So what degree of comfort can you give us? I mean, if you say you're gonna comply with whatever uh, Mr. Johnson wants, well, that's one thing, but working through it kind of gives me the impression that there may be some give and take still. So, I mean, the, the township engineer gave you, I think a four or five page letter citing to a number of technical things. And I, I do agree with that. I, I think we as a committee or a commission would want to have some degree of comfort that we'll comply as we'll comply. It is. I mean, there's, I, I don't, I mean, or, I, mean the, I, I think we had discussed it and I think we both agree that most of these comments are, are addressable without a lot of major changes. Addressable, yes, but as uh, Mr. Winterhouse said, it's not addressed yet. And if you're asking for our recommendations for final approval, I think uh, we need to be more confident, unless... Uh, uh, I think you want me to give you maybe a little summary of what, what I think on the comments. Yeah. So I think there's actually a few of them uh, are pretty much uh, doc just documenting kind of where we are in the application. So if we look through the zoning comments, the first one is really just an acknowledgement that they are seeking, they have to obtain that conditional use uh, approval. And uh, as they say, and they have filed that application, that's just going to run concurrent. Uh, before the supervisors um, for the conditional use approval and for the land development approval. Um, so they have everything in place to seek that. And then, you know, at this point, it's up to the supervisors. Uh, the remainder. Oh, Eric, if I may, I, I do think that the, the planning commission would want to hear a little bit about that. And I think Mr. McKay is right, can provide that information. Specifically, I, I believe the intent is to prove that there is. No other reasonable method to um, uh, to develop the property without encroachment into the steep slope areas, and I think the the focus is on where those end walls and stormwater uh, that the stormwater system has to pass through. So maybe it's a good time to to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Perhaps what's the right planch? Um, okay. Um, Let's go to, I think, the first grading plan. Let me go to seven or eight. With the conditional use plan? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, put that one up. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, here we go. So before you start there, Brett, let me just set the stage. So the uh, stormwater management facilities are permitted in areas of steep slope. So in order to do that, you have to make a conditional use application, which is done. And then and there are certain standards. So it's a conditional use, much like special sections contemplated in the additional extra standards that uh, it doesn't have to demonstrate satisfaction. So to that end, um, section 134.14 has a list of uh, criteria, essentially. Uh, you don't need to go through every one, but the the main one is to, to demonstrate that this is a uh, the the only feasible or practical location for any particular thing. So with that as background, Brett, and I know you did this before, but if you could point to where the stormwater management facility is, where the steep slopes are, and what uh, what protections and procedures. You and the contractor will be going to protect. Right. All right. So the the stormwater basin is this large structure here. The steep slopes that we are disturbing are, are these slopes up in here, down in here. Um, as Mark said, uh, obviously we have to be below the proposed improvements. And if we try to move it any further, you can see the edge of the wood line here. I mean, I don't, we're not going to get out of the steep slopes before we would get to the woodlands. So our, our feeling was it was uh, much preferable to uh, locate it in the steep slopes since this disturbance will actually only be temporary during the construction of the bed. Uh, once the bed's installed, the ground surface pretty much goes back to the way it was. Um, so, so, Brett, I'm not to put your mouth, but the, the other, you have to keep it downhill, and if you go further downhill, essentially you have to take down trees so that's somewhat safe. Correct. 
Yeah, if I say we'd be in the woods. Okay. It's your opinion that that is not a good idea. That's my opinion, yeah. So. Now, how about if you just uh, talk about the NPDES permit, protein sedimentation control, and how, how this is managed to minimize the both the physical disturbance and the, the amount of time that's disturbed? Well, as I say, we'll have to get a, an NPDES permit for this. Um, will be required to uh, prove that there's not going to be any erosion between the discharge and uh, the property line. Uh, will also be required to prove to the conservation district as well as township engineer that there won't be any erosion during construction. Have you applied for the NPDES permit already? Not yet. Is there an also another pipe system encroachment from very steep oh, on the on the lower end of that plan? No, do an end wall. This area here? Yes. Uh, yeah, but this, this we're assuming is man made because it was in place to build the, uh, uh, I don't know what the heck that was that the trap range? Yeah, 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 the trap range. So, um, and that's been, been there for years. So, again, just to be clear with the planning commission, the, the ordinance is written such that if they are man made, Right, and that was the consensus we reached that that is in fact man-made slopes that were put in place when they built the ski ring and um, all that. So as a technical matter, the, the areas of the ski slope, the stormwater basin that was okay, but just pointing out are, are natural. Which if I heard correctly is temporary. Yeah. While construction is being done, then it will resume back to its original Format. Yeah. So, 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 so to be clear, the additional use and the, the disturbance of steep slope allow other things besides the storm. Yeah. You meet the right criteria, you can have certain structures. In fact, these criteria talk about uh, engineering design so that the footings are designed to extend the state of soil and bed. We don't have a structure in the sense of a building. Right, and that's really where we got into confusion of why we thought we didn't need the conditional use to begin with. But mm -hmm. it, it uh, the township's position is the structure. We have to agree with them. It's a structure in the sense, though, that it's underground. So bed will go in, there will be, there'll be you know, topsoil will be put on top, it'll be, it'll be re grassed, stabilized, and you won't know it's there. That, that is the condition that exists right now. This is an area that's not in the woods, so it's it's grass area. That's what it'll be when the construction. Mr. Chairman, now may be a good time to ask for public comment on the issue, on the application. Before that, any other comment by the board? Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, from the audience, who would like to? Yes, sir. Regarding this presentation. Yes. Uh, yeah. Please come in. Sure. Say your name and address. Thank you, Britt. Hi, my name is Lewis Walker, and I uh, live at 101 Hillview Lane. And uh, my wife and I attended the meeting in November when the uh, presentation was made. And uh, we're pleased to see the plantings have been proposed uh, for by the town arborist along the St. David's Road, uh, because our house is on St. David's Road looking on to uh, you know, Rodney, St. David's would buy our house. And in, um, so we're appreciative of that, but our concern is we did receive in a letter here of November 28th, from Mr. Barry, regarding the PICO initiative to take those trees down. That's been now addressed by the initial trees being planted. Um, regarding the paddle lines, uh, Mr. Barry does say the lights are on later than I indicated many evenings. In fact, they're on just about every night, well in excess of the township ordinances. And uh, in addition to the lights being, but the noise accompanying the lights that are on until anywhere from 9 17 p.m. during the week to 10 46 p.m. on the weekends is. 
is not very conducive. You can't see the windows open because the light shines through from the paddle ports. The music you know, obviously comes across, but I have uh, also noticed there were new large Christmas lights that burn 24 seven along the tennis facility. So we have those lights on all the time, in addition to the lights in the parking lot, which I understand are safe. But the large, you know, incandescent looking bulbs around the tennis facility on all night is a bit too much. And I, I would have thought under the township ordinance regarding the light that those would have to be switched off as well. And then so our concern is when these projects are completed, will will the club still not be expected to adhere to the township ordinances regarding the light and the noise pollution? Um, I look back during the golf season in the late tennis season uh, regarding the use of the landscaping equipment before 7 a.m. And the chapter 106, section 106, dash six of the township ordinances, paragraph B3, it, term, it details the hours by which power equipment can be used. And it cannot be used between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. the following day, including tools, equipment, et cetera. And our concern is, even though the plantings are being made, the additional ports coming our direction is going to continue to create a nuisance that at night we can hear everything going on as if it were we were standing there. And what I've done, and I'd be happy to provide you with, is I have time stamped videotape of lights and noise for five consecutive days of the paddle, whatever the ports are over there. I Paddle or paddle, but at a minimum, the ordinances are not being adhered to, and it is very disruptive. And you know, we are tolerant of the trap shooting on Sundays. We knew that when we moved here. We were tolerant of the trap shooting on Wednesdays. We knew that when we moved here. But it's the nighttime from 9 p.m. to 10:46 p.m. As late as 10:46 p.m., the music. And the lights and the noise of the paddle ports is uh, untenable and it's uh, very unpleasant. And the lights shining through our master bedroom, master bath, and everything, you know, we have plantation shutters up and close it, but it, it still precludes us from sleeping with the windows open because of the music. And I know there's road traffic as well, but the constant music until, you know, well after the ordinances uh, stipulate is is disruptive. So that's all I have to say. Does this happen year round? Pretty much. Yes. On the paddle ports? Well the paddle ports are seasonal. I was gonna say but then it switches to the blowers where the landscapers are wearing the headlamps because it's dark. So they come out before 7 a.m. and run the blowers. So no the, the paddle is seasonal. And then there's no tree, you know, no uh, leaves in trees. Which exacerbates. So in the summer, then you know it's, there, there's none of that stuff. But then the blowers come on every day between seven a.m. before seven a.m. with the uh, miners' lamps on the ground for the landscapers. Uh, well, the we need to be able to separate between two things. The uh, the applicant is here for approval of plans of development. Yes, which is. For a short period of time, they'll do construction, they'll be done with that, and then the results will be uh, will remain. The light and the noise after hours, something else okay. that is controlled by other ordinances okay. of the township. And okay. I think you you can uh, appeal to the township to enforce okay. whatever rules they are. Okay. Well, I want to make our point clear that. By adding these additional ports closer to our house, our concern is the it will be exacerbated noise. Yeah, there, there, I, I think it's fair to say that um, the fact that we approve or the uh, uh, the board approves the improvements does not give them license to violate the ordinance. 
So if you have a complaint that the ordinance is being violated, you can bring that to the proper yes. authorities Thank you. under the ordinance. And I did read the minutes from the November meeting. They referred to the lights that are going to be installed or going to be some high soup. I don't know what they call it. Now regulations for that yes, too. That's right. Yes. And will that be re retroactive to the lights that are currently installed or no? If those are not in compliance, I don't know. I'm not a I don't think so. That that would be Andy, separated. Okay, Andy, if I may, I mean, I believe that we can we can require a photometric plan to be provided with this application at the end of the project to make sure that there's no glare. So the ordinance that we're talking about really is there to prevent glare onto adjacent properties, and it's beyond uh, zero point two foot candles at the property line. So that's the gold standard of our ordinance in regard to light. So with regard to these improvements, yes, we can, I think we can require a photometric plan to be provided once the lights are installed, if they are proposing any exterior lights with this project. Um, if they're not proposing any exterior lights with the project and we can, buy, we can verify a violation, we can still go down that road because it, it's, it's, the ordinance protects against glare extending beyond the property line. So I, I want to make it clear that there's a distinction between glare going beyond the property line and being able to see a light. I, I think that, that it's clear that that's where the ordinance lies. With regard to noise, noise is always a potential violation. Um, so our ordinance protects from a certain decibel level between specific hours of operation. So yes, you're correct, sir, that if there's any operations that are going on between the hours of 11, uh, 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning, they would have to comply with, I believe, a 50 decibel level at the property line. So certainly if this gentleman is hearing uh, all that noise in his home, there's obviously some concern there from our part that there's a violation of noise ordinance we could do something about that. We could check that out. And we would simply take our noise meter out, go to the right-of-way line or the nearest property line and take a read. But the problem with noise is we would have to be there while it's happening. So that ordinance is enforceable both by my department, the code department, as well as the police department. Police are here 24-7. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience? No. Um, Do we want to ask Ronamek if they want to respond to the comment at all? Do we want to ask Ronamek if they'd like to respond yeah. to the call? Yes. Yeah. Right. Can I? Please. Yes. Sure. Just Bill Barry, 207 Carriage Lane, Town Square, and also the president of Ronamek. After the November meeting, I sent the letter to Mr. and Mrs. Walker and offered to um, address any concerns they had. And uh, in the letter, Mr. Walker misrepresented what I said. I didn't say we were violating uh, ordinances. I said, let's talk. We want to be a good neighbor. And uh, to my knowledge, in the 20 years that Mr. Walker has lived there, he's never reached out to us and said, hey, there's a problem. Yes, ma'am. Please come in. I, I just want to say before, before this uh, woman speaks that, um, you know, the other thing again is that the intention of the landscaping plan would be to try to, uh, you know, offset some of the some of the issues that he's having. Now, it doesn't do anything with the noise, of course, but in terms of in terms of the lighting, you know, we would hope that the uh, significant landscape uh, enhancements that we've got will will help with it, will help with their uh, the the uh, glare as Andy said the offsite you know, we're, we're not going to have any spillover from the property line but we do understand that they can still see lights and hopefully some of these evergreen plantings can help. That's in the winter time. We uh, if there are evergreens. Sorry. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Janet Cravenas. I am on the Environmental Advisory Council, uh, and uh, I'm also chair of Birdtown for our, our township. And I just wanted to, uh, I live at 23 Paper Mill Road uh, and have for 40 years, so I'm 
been in the area for a long time. I wanted to point out that uh, weather radar has shown that most birds migrate at night and light pollution is a real conflict for them. So much so that uh, in the Philadelphia area, they have started a lights out program uh, in the Philadelphia region to turn out lights uh, uh, during the migration period from April 1st through May 31st. Um, and also that lights, when they are uh, uh, put up, they should be pointed downward so you don't have that uh, light pollution that goes straight up into the air. So um, uh, I'm here to speak for the birds uh, and uh, hopefully that those light uh, issues will be addressed in the uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment from the public? Um, I have a question, uh, Eric. So if we recommend a poop, this plan goes in front of the uh, supervisors. The time, first of all, for the applicant to complete all your items. So when they come in front of the supervisors, you can uh, issue them a, a clean bill of health. Well, I believe we have an extension of time that was granted by the applicant till April 27, 2040, which would be the day of the last board meeting in April. So a, a decision would have to be made at that time. Now, of course, it's up to the board's discretion if they accept, if they approve it with conditions or they deny the plan. But a, a decision would have to be made on that date based upon the current extension. And I would say to my end, to the, uh, the comments of the review letter, um, they are down largely to, to just uh, either asking for some additional information on the plan or some technical clarification uh, in their stormwater report. Uh, but it's really, it, it, there's nothing left that's gonna have substantive change to the plan. It's just mm -hmm. documentation of the plans. Okay, other than that, uh, I understand the farm marshal, everything has been addressed. And Andy, any zoning issues outstanding? No, other than the conditional use. Right. And uh, the uh, landscaping is all fine as far as you're concerned. Yes, yeah, that correct. They have a few species changes to be made, but other than that, they're fine. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to make a motion to recommend the approval of the preliminary and final land development plan, I guess phase two that has been presented by Aronimic Golf Club, along with the conditional use request that is being made in conjunction with the waivers required for the uh, steep slope ordinance, provided that there is full compliance to the satisfaction of the Township engineer with regard to the, the items that were outlined in his letter dated March 17th, which I understand are, um, while they're many in number, 22 in number, that will be complied with consistent with our recommendation. Um, I don't believe that there was anything significant with the fire marshal's request, no. and I think everything else is in order. Um, Mr. Hofbeck is here tonight. I believe that the the landscaping plan should be appropriate based on the information provided. So as a result, I will move for preliminary and final recommendation of this land development plan, along with the conditional use to the Board of Supervisors. So. Second the motion. Everybody for it, say aye. 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 Uh, the motion is moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't know. 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 I didn't Oh, okay. The next time you say you get loud and say we know. Okay. Okay. Okay, ready? All right. Um, item number 7.2, Tony Knoll, land development application. 
Good evening. I'm sitting here so many times. I feel like I wouldn't mind if I sat here. Don't you have an address here on the other? Um, good evening. Um, my name is Jim Gade, double engineer from Stantec. Uh, I'm here presenting the Stony Knoll 18 lot residential subdivision. Uh, it's uh, located at the corner of Whalen Avenue and Hunt Valley Lane. Um, last month we were here and presented the changes for the land development and the subdivision plans. The changes from the previous year, uh, approval last year, we went from 13 lots to 18 lots. Um, the road pretty much stayed the same. Stormwater pretty much stayed the same with some, some minor tweaks. Um, we had a uh, pretty good discussion with the public about the stormwater management. We explained again how it'll uh, benefit most of the people on Echo Valley and on Hunt Valley by diverting the water that's currently coming down um, to their backyards. Um, there was several review letters that, if you don't mind, I just want to go over. Um, so uh, the first one was the fire marshal. It was a pretty clean letter. Um, the only issue he had was, uh, as you know, we're extending a water line down from water from White Horse Road all the way down to the to the new subdivision through our new road and connecting it to an existing uh, water line off of uh, Echo Valley. Uh, it's about 2,600 linear feet of an eight inch uh, water main that we're installing. Um, the fire marshal asked if we could extend it a little bit further down Wayland to uh, incorporate way, um, lot 18. Um, and we kind of made the, um, we made the option of instead of bringing it all the way down an eight inch, all the way down into the road to connect to a road that we can easily have an easement through one of the lots and connect uh, into the existing, either the new uh, uh, fire main in the road or down to the existing one down in um, Hunt Valley Lane. He didn't have any issue with that. His only concern was if you're going to have a service line as opposed to a fire main, just make sure that it's um, sized correctly. So, because to go over the, the, the additional length would probably mean instead of a, an inch and a half fire line and a three quarter domestic, you probably have to upsize it. So we had no problem with that. Um, the other uh, review letter is the landscaping um, from Mr. Hoshback. Um, all those were pretty simple. The only issue is once again, since um, we're replacing trees, there's like 200 some trees that we have to replace. And we like to stick them along the road. The, uh, the township wants to stick them around the road. There simply isn't enough room for that. So the question was, what do we do with the additional 110 trees? Uh, and what we did is, is we, we talked to John and we said, what if we, instead of uh, doing fee in lieu of, what instead of we take that 110 trees and we divide it by the number of lots and we actually put them on the lots. So each lot would roughly get an additional six trees. Um, Mr. Hoshbach didn't have any issue with that. And that's certainly what we can show um, in the revised uh, landscape plan. So that didn't seem to be an issue. Um, on the zoning letter, um, Mr. Rayshack, there was no real issues with that. There was just fill in a couple of charts, which uh, uh, we have no problem do. There is one item on um, the, uh, what is it? The irregular lots, um, how they're supposed to have a 150 foot uh, front yard. Um, the, the width of the lots have to be 150 yards, uh, 50 feet, 150 feet wide along the cul-de-sac. But because of the cul-de-sac, that makes it a little bit difficult. So. There's an ordinance um, in the zoning that says for irregular lots that we could go to the Board of Supervisors and request that instead of measuring that frontage at curb line, we can move it up to where the building line is as long as we have 75 feet along the street line, which we do. Um, there was some discussion about having to get a decision from the, the solicitor uh, on whether or not that was a zoning change or just a simple decision by uh, the board, but um, that's the position we're going to take, and, and I don't, I don't think we uh, advanced that any, Andy. I, I don't think we did, but I know that I, I did read your email, and I think we're at this point where I, uh, I believe it's important to make that final determination. From my perspective, I think if it's in the hands of the board, that's the board has full jurisdiction to make that recommendation at that time. Last time, last meeting, you you raised an issue that perhaps it would require a variance. Am I wrong? Well, no, I think it's in lieu of a variance. So if it, if that stipulation hadn't been added in there, 
then by all means, I think they would have been re required to get a variance. But because of that stipulation regarding irregular lot frontage, I think it does put it in the hands of the board. Okay. I think it has to be specifically addressed by the board, but I do think it's in their hands. And that's the issue of the lot frontage. Right. Yes, along the only only on three lots along the full sec. Yes. Regardless of our moving this forward to the board, that's the board's I think that mechanism the board's issue to, to deal with. Instead of directing the applicant to the zoning hearing board, correct. It'll be addressed at the board supervisors. Regardless of us pushing it forward. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, and then there was the. Um, uh, Township engineer review letter and uh, Mr. Porter's here. We can definitely go over that in uh, detail. Um, but I would say that in reviewing them, uh, there's only really two issues that I think would change anything on the plan. The rest of them are just, you know, you have to you have to apply for agreements. You have to get your permits from DEP. Put a couple more notes on the plan. Confirm this. There's only one issue uh, that I think would change the plan, and that's lot 18. And um, Heather, I was wondering if you can. Yep, please. The um, the issue being, um, I didn't go to a grading plan too. Uh, the issue being that on lot 18, that's the one on the corner of Whalen and Hunt Valley Lane, there's some wetlands that, on there that uh, we identified in a report a while ago. And then we sent out recently in August uh, a, a wetland specialist to confirm that where we show the, the wetlands on the plans is still accurate, which he gave us a letter saying, yes, the, uh, the wetlands are still, as depicted on the plan, are still uh, accurate. Um, and, and Mr. Porter's review letter, um, Wendy, can you go to uh, the blow up of that? I think it's two, I'm sorry, um, Heather, uh, two sheets down. Yep, one more. There you go. Um, in the uh, uh, the upper uh, right hand corner is the lot, and uh, the wetlands now are they're real close to uh, Hunt Valley um, Lane, and uh, according to the ordinance, we have to provide a fifty foot um, buffer. Uh, and right now, the way this we have there's a small stormwater management for that individual house there. You'll see that little. Kind of smile shape uh, thing, and it encroaches inside that fifty foot buffer. So he asked that we move that out of there, and um, that's we got plenty of room to move it over to the left side of the lot. So we'll comply with uh, moving that out of the buffer, and that's really the only change, significant change that's going to be on the plan. address the wetlands issue. Um, I, I think the issue, as it, as it's been raised by the Environmental Advisory Council, is that the wetlands delineation. That you're ultimately relying on was done in 1984, and that was that predates both the national and state environmental protection agencies coming out with standards for how you delineate wetlands, which are now in effect nationally and in Pennsylvania specifically. And the concern is that if you don't do a wetlands delineation that complies with the current standards as established both federally and, and locally, how do we know, how can we rely on, on a wetlands delineation that doesn't meet their standards? And I'll ask you that question. Is that an issue that- Yeah, I, I mean, I what I'm used to seeing is wetland delineation done uh, jurisdictional determination. That's something that, I guess we could require as part of the uh, approval. Well, process. absolutely. Yeah. If, if I well, if I may, uh, jurisdictional determination is only advised or even required when you're disturbing the wetlands, because with that you have to determine how much you're disturbing and how much you got to mitigate. We are not disturbing the wetlands whatsoever. Right. And in uh, and and I uh, presented this to. Uh, the township uh, on August 31st, 2021, we got a wetland specialist to go back out there and confirm the delineation as shown on the plan. And in his letter, he basically says, uh, and, he, and he talks about uh, the current um, uh, wetland delineation manual, stuff like that. And he says that uh, as the outer limits of the area are within the well-defined quarter, the area as shown on the existing plan appears to be accurately reflect the limits of the wetlands on the property. Well, uh, Jim, 
Right. I'm First just, of all, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, Mike, do we know what, I think it was Mr. Duran who did the original, has anyone looked at what he actually did back then? I mean, I, I'm just, I'm focused on the fact that there's a procedure for delineating wetlands. It wasn't in effect when he did his work. It's in effect now. And how do we, you know, is that review process in effect under the current regulations for, for how you delineate wetlands? I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a wetlands expert, but I, I have dealt with wetlands and I'm not too sure there's a change in the wetlands. There's three, three requirements for wetlands. wetlands. Uh, well, well, there's three requirements for wetlands. There's hydric soil, there's vegetation, and there's water. All right, but uh, I don't think that uh, delineation that uh, was done back in the 80s is relevant anymore. You are preparing, you are proposing new plans. And uh, it will probably be an item in the review by DEP, but uh, that takes, a, takes it uh, away from us anyhow. I think it is necessary to delineate the wetlands as they are, they are today. And then if, if for nothing else, for two reasons, because then you can uh, measure the distance for your uh, riparian buffer. And also you are proposing uh, stream discharge and we don't know if it uh, gets to the wetlands or not according to the uh, drawing on the plan it doesn't but we don't really know that so i think it is uh i would like to see an, a current actual delineation of the wetlands as they are today so if i send someone out to do a wet, wetland delineation I, and and it's the same they would basically give me the letter i have here Yes, no, I'm talking right. about flagging and, and surveying the uh, the extent of the wetlands, not a little by. Let me catch up maybe for the ed education of myself and maybe some of the board and also the, the audience. The, the issue is, and I'm asking the question, the delineation question is, hey, I don't think your definition of what wetlands is, is what actually is the wetlands now. I don't know. Maybe we, they no, I'm asking, is that the, the point of this debate to define what portion of this is wetlands and what is not? And I get your point, 1980s material may not be relevant. Is that what you're saying? It might have changed. I don't know. I agree. I want to I, know. I, what... Same question. Yeah. I, 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 so I'm just that's trying to I define. That's what, I you were getting at. that's what I thought you were getting at. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to say that delineation of what is the fact of what is wetland and what is not wetland is your question. What is wetlands and what is not wetlands is governed by 1987 EPA uh, standards that were established. They were amended in 2007 to 2010 to divide the country into 10 regions. We're in one of those regions and the regional specific wetlands delineations, the, the procedure that you go through and what you look for depend on what region you're in. All of that happened after 1984, which is we're relying on a 1984 wetlands delineation when there were no standards for wetlands delineation. And I think now that there are standards, we ought to rely on something that complies with the standards. Holding on that point, Andy or someone maybe in the technical background, do we have precedent on this wetlands issue in the township for other projects where we did or didn't use 1984 material? Yeah, absolutely not yet. Wetlands would have to defer. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Well, if you were my weapon scientist, yeah. I can tell you typically what happens is when you're proposing a project, you have what weapon scientists go out and field the lineage weapons. You have uh, surveyors pick up the flags and show that limit on plan. Now, it's not unheard of to have a wetland scientist go out there for some years fire to verify the boundary that's on a plan and it appears that that's what they had done here um however given the amount of time that's obviously concerning to me but if wetland scientist that is licensed 
as a professional wetland scientist is certifying to that boundary now, it's out of my realm of expertise to contradict that. The only recourse the township would have would be if there are other permits. I don't recall anything in township ordinance specifically that gives us the ability to challenge that. Certainly, in our office, I'm sure the, the township engineer's office, and only associate has licensed wetland scientists on staff that could go out to verify or in connection with the and as permitting or the chapter 105 permitting. Um, and chapter 105, this is where I disagree with Mr. Dave, chapter 105 permitting, the jurisdictional determination could be a requirement of that permit, regardless of if you're disturbing, proposing the service of wetlands or not, to verify what that boundary is so that the certified should not approach into the wetlands as well. Um, whether the DC or the Army Corps of Engineers like to entertain a jurisdictional determination that's outside the realm of, of what I can speak to, but certainly with going through those permits, that question were to be asked, those two agencies could, could weigh in on that. I can give you a matter of perspective from where we were doing design for the sanitary sewer project in Newtown Township. We had several uh, stream crossings and wetland impacts, uh, both temporary and permanent, and the jurisdiction determination was declined by the Army Corps of Engineers. They just concurred with the licensed professionals that we had help us with our permitting uh, and, and their delineation. The Army Corps typically doesn't want to go out to re-delineate well. So that's just food for thought. So on that note, you're saying that your backup or your reasoning for the wetlands definition is the 1980 material yes i i yes i'm okay. right correct okay is it our jurisdiction or purview to define if that's relevant or not well i don't i don't know i don't know the answer to that I question think, i think I, I I Belkin, sir, most likely dp will require that anyhow in my opinion but uh whether they do or not uh as far as it, uh up to us we are across to what to measure the riparian buffer for uh, from the wetlands yeah. or the way it is written from the bank of the stream uh, to the disturbance. And Jim already uh, made a comment about that that this uh, basin actually falls within that district. Yeah. Uh, so um, if you yeah, that is the wetlands. Right. So if you delineate the wetlands, it is delineated by an expert who, who puts flags in the ground and uh, Stantec surveyor will uh, shoot the weather flags and so on and show the edge of the uh, wetlands, whether it is a line as shown here or somewhere else, then it probably will be accepted and the buffer can be measured from that. It may be uh, further away or less away than uh, the plan currently shows. So, uh, but I think we need to know that. And uh, in my opinion, DEP will also want to know where exactly the stream discharge is going to be. That end board here. Mm -hmm. Okay, whether it touches the wetlands with the uh, um, with the uh, outlet control and, and outlet. Uh, so I, and so I think I heard you say the board, us, could deny or approve and move it along tonight, yes. right? But they still would have to get someone to come out and define what the wetlands are even after our approval. Well, they, they have to go for an NPDES permit. They have to That's, apply for yes. that. And then it goes to DP. They have their own jurisdiction. They have their own review. So even if we approve it, right. and it moves forward, to do with I it. got it. Okay, I got it. Yep. Any response to this conversation? Uh, the other thing I'd say is um, you're asking us to go out there and redelineate it, and we had it in a sense go out there and confirm that that's the areas. But, well, you the, know, the, what, the, the note on the plan is really what caused me a little concern because the, the note on the plan is what the engineer is willing to sign. And 
you know, he, he didn't say that the former delineation conforms with um, the requirements of DEP. He said it, it appears to be a fair representation of the existing wetlands. Well, it's just sort of backed up by a wetland scientist in mm -hmm. August of 2022. Is that letter referenced on there? No, but it will be as part of additional notes that um, Mr. Porter is asking. I'm coming number 37, my review letter uh, speaks to this issue specifically. And with regard to the plans themselves, I did not see anything on the plans notating that um, this particular wetland investigation was done. Uh, I think the benefit the township and the applicant as well to have a certification placed on the plans to sort of recertify the, the wetland boundary, um, indicating that you, know, you have a wetland, professional wetland scientist that has done an investigation uh, in August of 2022, following the applicable U.S. Army Corps of Engineers manual, et cetera. And then they, they can certify to that on the plan itself by their signature. That's typically what, what our wetland scientist does on our plan. When we submit plans, we have him certify it on the plan itself so that it can be testified. But your expert did not review this particular plan to verify that information, right? No, no. And, and typically we don't. We, we would rely on the applicant's wetland scientist to do that if there were questions. We have had our wetland scientists go out to visit sites that were just painfully obviously lacking in the delineation. If we approve subject to obtaining a wetlands delineation, um, just to be able to move it along um, with the caveat that if the wetlands delineation requires a change in the plan, they have then, to come then, back. Then what happens? You know, well, they have to come back. The plan, if you make the condition that, and there's a change in the plan, then they would have to come back. They have to yeah. come back, yeah. I'm that's not, what? My no, I mean, that's. Oh, right. I think the planning commission should be aware as part of, in connection with the NPDS permit, with this discharge being to a high quality watershed, there may be some other repairing buffer requirements that have to right. be established as part of that permitting process. Um, wherever the stream is delineated on here, that buffer may exceed where the 50 foot requirement is with regard to Newtown Township's code. Specifically, so there may be other ramifications with that mm -hmm. permit. Um, relative to that permit, long term. Mm -hmm. I have another For question. instance, if, if that buffer is, is larger than the 50 feet, they may have to do additional grading or relocation of the reconfiguration of lot 18 to be able to acquire that permit. I have another question here about the um, uh, storm sewer. That uh, where that uh, discharges into the stream, and it comes from the lot above, and then uh, lot 18 connects to it, and uh, there is an easement there, right? Uh, yes. Uh, who will own the easement? The lot owner, lot owner, or is it the HOA? Uh, the HOA. Uh, there's. I don't believe there's anything at this point that we're proposing to dedicate to uh, the township, with the exception of the sewer, which will most likely uh, be dedicated to uh, Newtown Township Municipal Authority. So it'll be a private road, it'll be private stormwater management. There'll be an HOA set up to uh, uh, maintain it, um, and everything that's as a requirement by the by the township. I just could. I, I, we talked about wetlands. I do think that we need to know what's going on there, but uh, perhaps DEP will require that. Um, the, the plans are currently in review um, for the MPTS. Did you submit already? Yes, we did. Yes. Have you received any comment yet? No. <laughs> How long ago did you submit? Uh, well, to be honest, we, we well, because we had to submit new plans, we submit them January 31st. We got a couple of completeness letters. Hey, fix this. And now we've done that. And now it's probably on to more heavier uh, review comments as we speak. Um, okay. Um, Can we change the subject a little bit? Yeah. Because I have a few questions regarding the waivers. 
but before that, I just want to. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to make sure yeah. you're, you're no. with your. Right. So I, uh, my concern here is uh, I visited the, the site. And um, you know what it says from because of so many trees, you don't see the forest. So it's a very thick forest. And um, so I understand plant doesn't exactly show as far as I could see, but you don't show all the trees that you're taking down and they are calculated. Um, I wonder if there is uh, any way of uh, not cutting so many trees. Well, I, would, I will say that um, any tree that's over a certain caliber as required by the is being taken out, we do show on the landscape plan. It's, uh, they're, they're little X marks and sometimes they get lost, as you say, through the trees. So you might not see them. Um, a lot of the trees that are getting uh, taken down are, are getting taken down in the front uh, along Wayland Avenue to establish the uh, the landscape buffer. And uh, as I understand, a lot of those trees are old, 30, 40 years old, maybe even older and, and, and they're not in great shape. So the idea was that if we wanted to put in uh, the buffer, uh, and put in a landscape, it would be better than having trees that will stick around for another 20 years before they fall down. Uh, up the up the road on, on White Horse Road at that subdivision, you'll see that it's we're we're basically proposing the same type of thing. It's it's like a um uh a, a berm that's probably 10, 15 wide, five foot high with all kinds of uh trees in there. And that was one of the ways that one on the replacement trees we had. Uh, we put the buffers along uh, Wendland Avenue. Oh. Okay, so I, 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 I normally want that has no issue with this uh, H, HDPE pipe, but this presents a little issue. I did see the county said that they prefer the concrete pipe, and I saw that Mr. Porter suggested, well, this won't be the township's issue because the roads are going to be private. But we have to look out for the people who are going to buy these 13 lots. And is the HDPE, the, the, the high density polyethylene pipe, strong enough to not cause a problem for this future development? Uh, HDP has been used for the past 20 some years. Um, uh, most people prefer it over um, most people prefer it over the concrete because it's easier to use to, um, um, and uh, obviously it's, it's it's less expensive. The only even PennDOT will allow you to use that with the exception if you're doing crossing over um, a highway with heavy heavy load. So um, I be honest with you, that is the first time I've ever seen Delaware County planning. Departments say we don't object. They didn't note why they objected to it. Um, HDP is the standard around here. Uh, yeah, but I don't know why they did it. I we really say we prefer concrete, concrete in that letter. But yeah, but, but they didn't say why we didn't like no. HDP, and that's what I don't understand. Well, if I may, HDP is accepted everywhere. Uh, it, it's it's good has a, a good record. There is no reason actually to demand that to demand not to use it. Well, it's just that if if I, I don't think if they're coming here for an approval and the roads are going to remain private, the true the true people who are going to be harmed are the people who haven't even bought the lots yet. And I just want to make certain that the engineer is telling us on this application that it's going to be okay for those future people who buy those homes because nobody else is looking out for whoever that person is. I can tell you as the person who sealed and signed these plans that uh, HCP is an acceptable use and has been an acceptable use for drainage, even by PennDOT in certain situations for the past 20 years. Good. I'll rely upon that. Okay. So now talk to me about curbs and sidewalks and streetlights. Okay. What, what What's the issue there? What's going on there? As far as the curbs are concerned, um, as part of the stormwater management, which was the, one of the bigger issues in this development, is we are trying to keep it so the water coming off the street wouldn't go directly into an inlet, into a pipe, into a basin. The idea was that you would let it go into a swale, a grass swale. It would slow down the water. It would infiltrate a little bit of water. It would take out a lot of pollution, as it usually does, and then go into the pipe and go down. So if we had that type of swale, I think everyone has agreed over the past 
year or two that we've been talking about that, that is the better alternative. And you can't have the curbs because the curbs will just simply interrupt the flow before you get into that. Um, as far as the sidewalk is concerned, um, there, uh, there's a, uh, I believe the ordinance calls for sidewalks on both sides of a new road. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about, do we really need so, so uh, on both sides? Because the size of the lots, all these lots are going to be upwards of, you know, 1.2, 1.3 acres, some of them a lot bigger than that. And the roads themselves are going to be 32 feet wide, which is typically 24 is uh, what the township requires, up to 32. So we were kind of under the impression that you didn't necessarily need to go on both sides as long as there was a walkable uh, sidewalk on one side. And that's what the board, we had several discussions here. We had several discussions with the board and they also uh, approved that. And the other sidewalk issue is, and we kind of um, had some issues with this is the one along Wayland Avenue. Um, they uh, required that we go the full length of, uh, of our property from the top all the way down to Un Valley um, Lane. We kind of objected to that, um, mostly because uh, all the properties around there are private properties not to be developed. And it's like, you're gonna, you're gonna construct a, um, a sidewalk to nowhere. It's, it's not gonna go anywhere. One of the things we wanna have a second conversation with the, with the board is to say, maybe do a fee in lieu of, don't install them here because there really isn't a lot of opportunity to put um, adjacent sidewalks and maybe use it for other areas that seem a little bit more appropriate that the township would like to put sidewalks in. So th that's the sidewalks. How about the street lights? Could I just add to the sidewalk, uh, Jim Nolan? Yes, I heard something. Uh, there's a requirement, I guess, by the Planning Commission that we put 1,335 lineal feet of sidewalk on Wayland Road. I will tell you, there is no sidewalk on Whitehorse Road. There is no sidewalk on Wayland Road. There's no sidewalk requirement in all of Whitehorse, which I built, 55 homes, no sidewalk. Across the street, no sidewalks, 60 units. All the way down to Hunt Valley Circle and Hunt Valley Lane, both sides. For different Newtown, no sidewalk. We're required to put sidewalks in front of the houses. Okay, I can see that. But on Wayland Road, it's not going to be connected to anything ever. Everything is built around it. It's, it's such a waste. And I wish you would reconsider making us do the 1,335 feet of sidewalk on Wayland Road. And by the way, we're going to save a lot of trees on lot 18 by not putting the sidewalks in. We, we all want to do that. We'd like to save the trees. Well, there are two ways to address that uh, issue. Uh, one, either you agree when you make your agreement with the township that if ever the township uh, decides to put sidewalks there, then you would come in and pay for that and put an escrow for that. We're doing Lua. We'll do Lua. Right. Oh, doing Lua. Uh, in lieu of, it's a waste. Let's get residents. Public comment. Yes, street okay. Light oh, street, lights. Yeah, street lights. Street lights. Street lights. Street lights. Um, typically, you won't find street lights on a, on a large acreage development cul-de-sac like this. Um, it's just typical. And, and I know as, as the one uh, lady who came up was talking about light pollution, you kind of don't want to put them on there. But honestly, I, we're not that in favor. We're not in favor of that. It's usually up to the board that usually dictates, no, we don't want street lights. And yes, we want street lights. Um, my guess is if you're gonna put street lights up there, there's only gonna be three or four of them in the whole area. So, um, but I do know that uh, most of the on, you know, if you had tighter, tighter lots with more houses, you make the argument, but we're looking at one to two acre lots in here and a pretty long cul-de-sac. So, um, if the, if the Board of Supervisors said we want to put street lights in it, well, put street lights I'm up. sort of looking at the end user here and who's going to live in the, the big home and likely to be children, right? So I think it, it makes sense to have some sort of lighting on the street. I don't think it needs to be a lot, um, but I think there should be some. Then, uh, like I said, we will have this conversation with the board. So. Um, you, know, you request a waiver from that. 
Um, no, actually, we, we'll, we'll go in and say, yeah, we want a waiver, but it really doesn't mean anything. No, no, we're not going to question a waiver here because I don't even think there's a waiver requirement for streetlights. I think it's the decision of the board on whether or not they want to have it or not. And that's what we typically do. We go to the board and we say, we don't think we need them. What do you guys think? If they say yes or no, then that's how, that's how we react. It's Are we okay? The way the code is written is uh, in section 14836A. The street lights may be required if necessary by the board. Okay. No way to be required of the board. Okay, we'll open the discussion to the uh, yes, Tina. Um, I'm Tina Roberts Lightcap. I'm one of the supervisors. I'm one of the board of supervisors. I'm also the planning commission liaison. Um, and I hear a lot of discussion with the wetlands. And I know EAC had requested some information. So I just encourage you, as just as myself, I'm one of five, I just encourage you to make a note on your decision tonight to encourage the applicant to work with EAC and and our engineers on the um uh, store, and I'm, I'm sorry, not the stormwater management, but the wetlands issue, because I know that there, to Jack's point, there is some questions. So I do encourage in your decision to please encourage the applicant to work along with EAC. I know that they are concerned with the wetlands issue. Uh, so it does mean a lot to me as the planning commission liaison to continue that conversation. So thank you. Thank you, thank Tina. You. Anybody else from the audience? This was uh, street like concerning. I came up a little too early before. Sorry about that. Uh, Lewis Rosenthal, 20 Harris Drive. Um, I did want to make comments earlier only because of the continuation from your previous meeting, uh, which I was at, and this was discussed extensively uh, uh, till now. Um, actually, as a result of the previous meeting and um, and reading the extraordinarily copious notes that somebody took and our they're fantastic. Um, uh, the um, <clears throat> I actually went out um, and visited some of the homes uh, the, that were uh, represented at the last meeting and knocked on doors and wanted to make sure I could uh, go in their backyards. And, and I think some of those concerns that they've expressed haven't really been addressed um, on paper. Um, and I would encourage uh, the Planning Commission to ensure that that's done. The other thing is that <clears throat> there is a lot of cycles that have been spun on this issue. Uh, I mean, our codes department, um, your time, uh, multiple meetings, EAC review once or twice. Um, and it's not like we're building a community center here. The, 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 the stretch from uh, thir uh, 13 units to 18 units I think Mr. Gade had mentioned that the, the cost of materials went up and that's why they had to change this. So all of this activity and review is to, uh, in my mind, and, and I could be wrong here, to ensure profitability of this. And, and, and I don't think that uh, a township activity, flexing of code to ensure uh, a profitability of a developer is appropriate. If it was a community center or a 4-H, a, a location, um, I think it would be appropriate, but um, I would actually encourage uh, very similar the, the the folks who who just presented the Aronomy plan. Uh, they reached out to uh, folks who had an issue. Uh, they came to some agreement. They apparently presented a letter to you. And um, as as our supervisor just mentioned, I think it would be um, uh, time well spent for the developer to meet with. Uh, those committees that have been appointed by the Board of Supervisors uh, to render opinions, and and they just have really haven't been discussed tonight. So that that's all I would make is is that comment. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Nolan. Uh, may I address your comment about the uh, additional costs? Okay. Uh, when I had the thirteen lot plan, I liked very much. Okay, Carl King required me. In a water line, my new road at half a mile down one acres that connected to the existing eight inch drain. Nobody's going to tie into that. Nobody. 
It's fully developed all the way down Whitehorse Road. Nobody's ever going to tie in a half a mile of eight inch lane. I think it's because he wants to protect Belmore. I, I have no idea. And then we have the other 1,335 square uh, linear feet of sidewalk down Wayland Road. I mean, come on. Can I respond to you? Sure. So, so what I would say is I'm there are opportunities that the township has read. Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, yeah, if, 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 if you want, please can be one at a time at the stand, please. Uh, um, what the fire marshal uh, requires, I'm not familiar with, but there are opportunities when a developer comes before a township or a municipality asking for permission and authority to build and develop. And those opportunities are how the citizens of the town extract value for that. And so as you're asking to build beyond as of right and asking for waivers, this is the residents' one opportunity to get something that means something to them. And so whether it's extending a fire main to Melmark, if that was his motivation, that's not a bad thing. If you're building a community center that allows for public access on some of those lots, that wouldn't be a bad thing either. So this is the opportunity for the township to say, this is what we want in exchange for what you want. And so, as the supervisor said, and as the folks at Aronimi demonstrated, you got to work with some of these folks and let them be your biggest advocate for, for this. That's all. And I don't want to, um, this is not supposed to be a debate. All right. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience, please? Yes, please. Uh, one by one, please. <laughs> it's now green. Hi, I'm Terry McCarthy. I live at 3510 Goshen Road, been here since 1982. And I'm on the Trails and Greenways Committee, and I'm on the board at Garrett Williamson. So sidewalks are for children, in my mind. Living on Goshen Road, where we don't have sidewalks until you almost are at Culbertson, is dangerous for families who want their children to walk to school. In the future, hopefully there will be more sidewalks in this township. That was a priority from the, uh, the plan, the strategic plan. We want more walkability here. We want more trails. And uh, in a perfect world, you would see a brilliant $3 million home, five of them maybe in that environment that connect to the meadows, that connect to um, Wallingford. And I hope that you can perceive the value of it beyond just the fact that it's gonna be expensive and whatnot. And I hope we preserve those trees as well. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Stelix in 4727 Mill Hollow Lane, also the former chairman of EAC and the now chairman of Fair Blue. And I come to you about the trees. The tree absorbs 10,000 gallons of water from the year. Um, I'm very concerned about the state of Crumb Creek. Uh, the, the stream discharge that you all talked about, it, you know, it affects Lewis Run. Lewis Run flows into Crumb Creek. In my mind, Crumb Creek is that it's maximum level of water. Of course, you can see that if you go and look at examine the uh, the embankments of Crumb Creek down around the cement bridge where New Town becomes edge mine. You can see all of the uh, galloping that goes on and how the, the ground underneath the where you stand has been really eroded. I am very worried about taking out a large number of trees, even if you have to plant Double the amount because we have to wait until they all grow to be mature. And those are very, very mature trees. In my mind, it's not 18. Thank you, Paul. Anybody else from the audience, please? No.
Hi, I'm Trish Adams, 3873 Gradyville Road. I'm also uh, the chair of the Shade Tree Commission, but I want to switch hats a second. I'm also a, a federal fish and wildlife biologist and all the discussions about wetlands. I just want to bring to your attention that on March 20th, 2023, the final rule that revised and updated the definition of waters of the U.S. I think that you um, should take a look at that. Um, I'm happy to provide to you the documentation of that, and I think that may have some bearing on your decision here. Um, and also, um, as a biologist who reviews plans for impacts to habitat, um, I do believe that this project will have an impact to uh, lot 18 in particular to those wetlands because of the proposed removal of the trees. And also, so that's a direct impact. Uh, bringing equipment into that area to remove those trees will result in a direct impact. Then there will be long-term indirect impacts to that wetland from stormwater runoff from the various lots draining into that area. So I'm gonna take off my Fish and Wildlife Service hat and I'm gonna put on my Shade Tree Commission hat if you don't mind. Um, so what brings me a concern is that um, this development will remove nearly every tree that's on this property. So the, in total, there's 49 trees that are to be removed. And in total, um, 298 trees are proposed to be replaced. And <clears throat> while I, I definitely appreciate the revisions and to have lot, uh, more trees placed directly on those lots. Um, I do believe that um, the shortage of those 110 trees should remain um, on the property itself. Um, and including, there could be some amelioration to some of the stormwater impacts if some of those, plant, those trees were planted and around near the drainage basin as well. And, for those trees that are to be placed um, on private property, I guess my question is, how will we ensure that those trees will be protected in perpetuity, that once the development goes in, that the landowner can't go in and just remove those trees, thereby um, causing yet another impact? Um, and I think there needs to be stringent um, requirements, some sort of an easement or some sort of um, assurance that those trees will be protected in perpetuity. Um, also, um, it, it, the, I, what Paul said is absolutely true. I mean, the trees that are being removed on site, one of the main purposes of the shade tree ordinance is and one of them, and this is in um, section 158-3, the purpose. And, and one of those purposes is saving trees from the indiscriminate destruction and not unnecessary removal. What I'm not seeing in the plan is a proposal to avoid impacts to trees. And the bulk of the trees that are being removed are on lots um, 18 and seven. And of particular concern are those in lot 18. And before that we consider a replacement, I would ask that uh, there please be another consideration of avoiding impacts to those trees as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience, please? Cindy Mahalo, 87 Hunters Run, Vice Chair of the EAC, Penn State Extension, Master Watershed Steward. Um, I'd like to begin by quoting from the Constitution of the State of Pennsylvania, where it says, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. This is the law that governs, this is the constitution that governs our state. This is what we as appointed and elected officials are charged to uphold. To me, this supersedes as an umbrella, all of the different codes and the ordinances that we've talked about. It provides the framework of values by which we make the decisions that govern the land today, 
tomorrow, and for future generations. We in this country tend to view land as a possession, which we can use however we want, instead of an inheritance that we steward for future generations. So I think when we step back and look at this, we say, how will this land be? How will this support our children and future generations um, when none of us are here anymore? Um, I appreciate the um, discussion and concern about the protections of the wetlands, especially on lot 18. Um, this to me is the most vulnerable part of this whole property of land. And if you could um, blow up that screen, I would just like to enlarge it so everybody here can really take a look at what's happening on lot, lot 18. This, as you noticed, and uh, Shimon, I applaud you for going out and looking at this property because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. If you if you have seen this property, you can see that it is very heavily wooded, and you can see all those circles represent all the trees that will be removed for the are proposed to be removed for the construction of the house and the stormwater basin. Um, I think it's very important to get a wetlands delineation to know where the wetlands are today, not where they were 30 years ago. And by the way, if you've been there, you've seen this is not just squishy ground. These are streams with flowing water. These are the headwaters for tributaries of Crumb Creek. As Paul Seligson said, Crumb Creek is an overstressed um, stream. It flows into um, Springton Reservoir. The headwaters, this is where it begins with these wetlands. And I think Dave Porter, you can even agree as an engineer, wetlands are the most sensitive area in um, a watershed. They deserve the highest level of protection. Um, if you look at this picture, you can see the greatest concentration of trees to be removed are exactly where they're being removed to create the stormwater detention basin, which is incredible in its irony that trees are the most effective thing you can do to naturally, inexpensively provide biodiversity to control stormwater runoff and to clean our air, they absorb toxins. They are doing all this right, right now. So this development of lot 18 calls for the removal of all the trees that are already doing that beautifully to create a man-made stormwater detention basin, which attempts to do it in, in a less natural and effective way. So I think that the idea of developing lot 18 has significant negative long-term irre irreversible impacts on not only the wetlands, the water quality, biodiversity loss, the habitat value. It is just not a very good idea to develop that lot. I think the township has already showed flexibility to the applicant in granting the approval for a one way in and one way out. You've accommodated other requests that he's made. This I think is an area not to accommodate. Thank you. Yes, please. Good evening. Um, Janet Cravatis from 23 Paper Mill Road. Uh, I, um, I'm on the EAC and also Birdtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, I want to speak for the trees uh, on lot 18 today as a bird and as a pollinator. Uh, removal of the trees uh, is certainly going to impact our, our birds and pollinators. We are fortunate to live in a designated IBA. That's an important bird area of the upper Ridley Crumb Creeks, uh, which includes uh, Ridley Creek State Park, Tyler Arboretum, and our own new town meadow preserve, as well as vast expenses, uh, expanses of 
primarily why private land north of Route 3 with conservation interests of forest, grasslands, and wetlands. Um, there are tens of millions of birds that migrate through our region in a single month, and that these birds stop to rest and feed in our natural spaces, especially in our parks, in huge numbers during the fall and spring migration. But birds need more than parks. They need connect connected pathways of trees to rest in along their migrating routes and nest in if they stay in our area. Preserving our woodlands becomes vital, important for our birds whose numbers have dropped by 3 billion in the last 50 years. These are also essential for pollinators, moths and butterflies. <laughs> Doug Tommy, renowned entomologist, has found that an oak tree can host over 500 species of pollinators and the caterpillars that eat the leaves are nature's hot dogs for baby birds. If it takes over 6,000 caterpillars to raise a nestling of chickadees. The conventional model of landscaping in the United States that features the expansive lawns with exotic trees and shrubs has evolved for ease of maintenance and a tidy appearance. Sadly, turf grass and exotic trees and shrubs rarely provide food for pollinators such as moths and butterflies. As stewards of our township, we need to develop habits that support our native wildlife and provide a healthy environment for birds, wildlife, and people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shiloh Salvantini. I'm the chair of the EAC. Sorry, I um, had surgery and I'm supposed to be on bed rest, but this is too important of an issue. And let me explain to you, first of all, Mr. Nolan, I, you know, I appreciate, I spoke with you and, and you're, you've done some great developments in your town square and I appreciate all the hard work you've done in this. You've created beautiful burns at Weiser Village and we're just asking the same consideration for this property. This is our third go around with this property. If you recall, it was a 27 lot with a two-way, then it was negotiated down to a one-way with a cul-de-sac with 13 properties. We were delighted with your plans because in your plans, the waterways were identified as a high quality cold water fish. The, the um, sorry, the uh, easement and the issues with regard to lot 18, the repairing buffers that they had built in there were fantastic. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better plan with the second plan. But unfortunately, because of financial issues, a new plan came out. Now remember, this is our third plan. So this is our township resources that we're going back and forth to address an issue, and it's coming down to profitability for a developer. Now we're looking at this third plan, okay? And there's some great things in it. Uh, you have a berm around the outside perimeter because Echo Valley is experiencing tremendous stormwater issues. Those properties are impacted terribly so. So the berm is going to help that. You do have, which is really good, you have um, an on-site infiltration bed, which I'd like to get some clarity on that just to make sure, you know, is it a vegetation issue for the on-site infiltration bed that you have on each property? It's actually going to be an underground bed. Right. So you can plan. So who's going to do the planning? Is that going to be the individual property owner? Or are you setting up like a rain garden? Or how are you describing your on-site vegetation? Uh, yeah, at this point, it's, it's basically grass. It's just going to be grass? Yes, it's going to be grass. Mm. Yes. Okay. Because that would, we would hope you would maybe consider a rain garden because you can't. That, that, the one on 18 is about the only one that would be considered a rain garden. Because okay. it's shallow depth and can hold water uh, okay. and, and um, support but the But our concern was what happens if, and be, because this is part of, remember, you're at a higher steepage at this level. So if you don't have it in your certification of occupancy, the next property owner can come in and remove whatever you put in those infiltration beds. No, they can't do that because there will be, um, be an operation and maintenance agreement for each lot that they're not allowed to touch the stormwater. That's in okay. there. But I know there is the question about the water runoff from the roof of each property and uh, the drainage from each property. How will that go into the infiltration? Bed? That'll be fine. It will the, be fine. The roof drains will go right to the underground. And I know that the, um, and I'll tell you, uh, the, your report was phenomenal. You did a great job. And I really appreciate it, especially because you were so sensitive to every issue. And I, I can't thank you enough. I thought it was excellent. Um, but I did like item number six, which was the building coverage per and the impervious service per lot needs to be calculated. 
Once again, um, what we show on the plan is a typical house. We designed it for a maximum amount of impervious coverage. That's going to be in the plans in the stormwater. If anyone goes onto that lot and builds a house with more impervious, they have to come back to the township and get a permit and most likely adjust stormwater management. Right. Well, the plan, the second plan had a shortened driveway, and the third plan came out with 6,100 square feet of impervious surface in addition to a 6,200 square foot house. So that was our concern because the plan with 13 was actually less impervious surface. So this has more impervious coverage per lot. That okay. is correct. Okay. And, so, and plus it's 16 lots uh, and, or 18 as opposed to. Another item that I was a concern is item number 26 in Mr. Porter's report was the stormwater calculations were done on a 10 year uh, storm. And that is, not realistic. They were designed for all the, my, the only thing is it probably, um, uh, it didn't get included, but we, we have to design for the two all the way into the 100. Okay. And that's yeah, what it's just for the off-site discharge okay. analysis. And I, I noted that they provided Great. And um, so back to the wetlands. So there's a couple issues here. Um, we talked about wetlands and none of us are a wetland specialist. The individual, I believe you said he was a wetland specialist who did the report. But we couldn't find anyone in that company who had certification as a wetland specialist. So I'm a little confused. In in, which in the topic? report that you had issued to us, the, the, the letter was he, was he a wetland? He's a wetland specialist. Well, I understand it's a wetland, but he's a wetland specialist. That okay? Because we went through the um the actual professionals in there and did not find anyone that was a wetland specialist. Well, what, what certification? What certification. What what, what are you? So we what, just wanted to make sure that it was. A I will I will get that information. That would be great. Great, and also um. For the wetlands, okay, there's two issues. If indeed, you know, we, we talked about wetlands are not static and, you know, with 30 year old information, um, if you've actually taken a walk out to that property, I stayed on the street, I did not go on private property, but you can see the erosion issues is far beyond just lot, lot 18. I believe there's a lot next door, which is a property owner, that the erosion actually goes into his property. So, oh, but you didn't see the whole, pathway by your bridge all are you a Mr. Nolan's son? I thought it was a Nolan prop. Yeah. So that the whole erosion in the slope. But in the in the um engineers report they mentioned that the property right now is an agricultural site. So we did raise the issue if there was any type of agricultural waste because you know on the other side, if you've ever walked across Wayland on that pond that's on the other side, we went over there and saw algae blooms, which would be an indication that there is some type of you know, uh, fertilizers or things that are being added to that, and that is coming down through the stream. But I know that stream is not, we did not identify that water source that's on the property besides the wetlands. There is no stream, so to speak. Um, it, it would, uh, my guess is, as you said uh, previously, it's a collection, it's at the headwater. So there's not a really well defined stream. It's not, uh, as far as I know, it's not. Um, uh, indicated in any of the stream stats or any of the PA uh, water or anything like that. So I wouldn't call it a, a stream. You, you could call it a collection that eventually goes to the wetlands and eventually. But in your report from your wetland specialist, he refers to it as um, the waterways. So he refers to it as wetlands and then he refers to it waterways. So that's why there was that vagueness that maybe we could get clarity on. That would be helpful. I, I, will, I will get you clarity. Okay, great. Um, and so then we talked about the wetlands delineation. And, you know, there is another concern. We, the top of the property is all farmland. Lot 18 is a wooded lot, you know, and it's next to your property. It's a beautiful lot because it is natural and it's late. But the impact of this, we're taking down trees to put in a basin to retain water, right, on a property. Then we're going to have a home. And at the bottom, we're going to have a wetland. So at some point, there's going to be a deed restriction on this property. So from a marketability standpoint, who's going to really want to buy a property that has a basin at the top of it? their home, and then a wetlands that they're going to have restrictions on what they can and cannot do with that property. And eventually, hopefully, the wetlands delineation will prove that. And there might even be some other things on this. I mean, we, we haven't looked at a wildlife study impact. What is on there? Could there be the bog turtle habitat? The habitat could be there. Bog turtle was, uh, the habitat is in the area. The bog turtle was studied. It was part of the DI, uh, DEP when they uh, we applied for a, a, national, a Pennsylvania National Diversity Inventory Study. We sent a wetland uh, bog turtle specialist out there. They determined no... On lot 18 or in the up? We could anywhere there's wetlands. In lot 18 and in the back, they did it for could, could we have that, please? Because we didn't get a copy of that at all. 
I just can't do that. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and what about because of just the land, the nature of the land, you're talking 50 acres, which is owned by Newtown Township and Meta Preserve, Mr. Nolan's private residence, which is 50 acres here, um, the 50 acre property that's looking to be developed. And above that is Episcopal is probably so roughly 200 acres. So you're looking at the wildlife impact um, from Indiana bats or any other wildlife. Indiana bats were not considered. They were not considered. To investigate, yeah. Whether, okay. Whether well, they're endangered we now. Yeah. So. When we when we submit a Pennsylvania Natural Diversity Inventory, we go to a, a state website and they say, okay, in this area, here's all the uh, endangered species, endangered wildlife that you have to investigate. The only hit we had was to investigate for a bog turtle, which we sent out and we cleared that there was no bog turtle and um, PNDI approved. Uh, Another issue is, so we were at 13, right? And then we went to 18. So we got like a 36.8% increase in the number of properties. But another thing that you're not bringing attention to is there was roughly four acres of land from this parcel that were removed. And they're going to be given into Mr. Nolan's property above. And they are considered presently farmland. But I understand in your report, they're going to be grassland. So you're removing 8% of the parcel, right? You're increasing it. 36.8%. And, you know, it's a kind of a concern because it is Mr. Nolan's right. It's his property. You can do whatever you'd like to, but it's kind of like you're taking the four acres off. And I just didn't understand why. Do I get any credit at all for the 46 acres that I put under conservation? And that's fabulous. And you should be thrilled. And, you know, is that, okay? is that, that is actually excellent. And Mr. Nolan, you should be proud of that. But also remember too, the taxpayers that uh, you benefit from the tax consequences of a farmland district in that area. And this land right now is receiving the benefit of a farmland district uh, for this 50 acres. I mean, if you look at what they're paying from a tax perspective, it's very low, but it is being used for farm and it is conservation. And we all appreciate that. So nobody in any way disregards all the things you're doing. I think what we're just saying is, can we come to some reasonable approach here? That is, so when you're, you're, a great developer. You have beautiful properties. All we're saying is, look, you can still have profitability at 17. Can 18 just come off the table? It's a win for you. It's a win for us. You'll get your approval. But I will tell you, we have talked with the DEP. We've talked with DCC, CD, DCNR. I mean, this is a really important issue. And, you know, you have Dynasty Trust. This in this farmland is going to be, and his own property was up for sale last year. And you have a right. You've worked hard. You've been incredible, you know, successful man, and God bless you. Nobody's begrudging you. But what I'm saying to you is that my children will not benefit from this, and my grandchildren won't. So I'm asking you to let's say, let's just give the environment a win and just let let 19 just not be developed. You can have your 17. You do everything you're doing with the infiltration. You're doing your germs, but can we just kind of cooperate with each other and live in harmony as neighbors and and make it you know peaceful right away? I think that's, and if not, then we have to take it to the other level of going through all those, you know, official things. But I think there's an opportunity. And I I spoke with you before, you know, a tree on that property was from the year your, your grandfather came from Ireland. And as a dual citizen, we're taught stewardship of land. We are not owners of land, we're stewards. And you're passing this on to your generation and your children should benefit from it. But I would like all of our children to benefit from it. And that's my only thought. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Somebody can wheel me back. <laughs> Anybody else from the audience? All right. I hope so. Thank you so much. I hope you can Any other comment from the board? I well, I think I well we move, but uh, I think that uh, there is a lot to be considered here, and um, especially about Lot 18. And Mr. Nolan, if, as was suggested here, if you can talk to your neighbors, to the committees, and uh, come to some kind of a resolution here. Any any thoughts on the comments that you heard tonight, Mr. Nolan, relative to Lot 18 or anything like that? The first hour or the second hour? Either, Either one. Take your pick. I will absorb everything that I've heard. All I know is I'm putting 18 two-acre lots on 45 acres. Two-acre lots 
All these people live on two acre lands. I, I think the applicant is the property owner. And as long as he as the property owner does what is required what? under the codes, then we have a duty to recommend approval conditioned on compliance with what the laws are. Um, while I certainly respect the need to protect the environment, that, in, that, that need does not encroach upon what a property owner can do. These are going to be th these houses. There's going to be 18 houses here. We've already approved 13 houses. I just believe that it would be appropriate to approve this under the conditions. There's there's substantial compliance that has to be made with um, with Mr. Porter's letter, with Mr. Porter's requirements. Um, there's going to be a homeowners association here who's going to be obligated to maintain the roads and and the sidewalks. I think that I think that. There is a good point that this may not be appropriate to have a sidewalk along along Wayland Road. Um, it, it, it seems to me that this is a rural road, and and I'm not certain that that's going to promote what what our comprehensive plan says is for a walkable community. We're just going to place a sidewalk in the middle of nowhere. I think there has to yeah, be some this discretion. Is the main issue. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. While I while I agree, and I agree with your sentiment on the sidewalks as well as the property rights of the owner, my concern goes back to the delineation and procedurally, how does the delineation of a 1984 report regarding the wetlands get validated as it moves forward? While agreeing with you, Paul, I, I, no. while agreeing with you, Paul, on that, if that can be satisfied, is there a mechanism as it moves to the to the board where that gets solidified and clarified that it's appropriately done that's my issue well I'm if looking, that makes sense i'm looking at something else we have a review letter by our township engineer with 53 comments without getting to each one of them maybe some are easy maybe some uh -huh. are just technical 53 comments this is not something that you can uh, approve, give final approval for for plan with 53 comments. But at the very least, I would say at least, you know, shrink them to a reasonable number. So, I mean, table it until next time or what? Can, can, I, can I say something about the comments, um, Shimon? Um, as I said in the beginning, as I looked through these, the only changes to this development would be whatever a lot 18 and the uh, riparian buffer off of the wetlands would be. That's it. That is the only change that, that you're going to find on this plan. So, and and in those comments, a lot of them are like, there's waivers. There's, there's, there's like five waivers we're going to have to request. A lot of them are, don't forget, you're going to have to get your agreements. You're going to have to get your DEP approval. And as you whittle that down to 55, you're going to find there's only about two of them on there that have any kind of potential impact on the plan and they're related to lot 18 and the wetlands. Well, yeah, my, my main problem is lot 18, yes. I, I have to say uh, The 17 stormwater comments that we have, um, there is one that is pertinent to that preparing buffer and, and uh, most of them are technical in nature, clarification related to uh, Provide some additional spot grades on the plans to show where the drainage is going. Um, the comment was mentioned about indicating how or been collected in the online individual some surface exploration bed. Um, so that was a comment. Um, some discrepancies in elevation, things of that nature that are not really that significant, but they, they have to be addressed as part of the detail of the plan. Um, really other than the other stormwater comment is relative to lot 18. Recommending maximization of oh. the, the separate post development in the wetland area. Um, and as part of that, so profile comments, all these so four profile comments, and rotation and fabrication. Uh, there's five comments relative to sewage planning and, and uh, sanitary sewer design. Um, one is very minor detail modification. One is 
chapter one of five permit for the street crossing of the West Side Sewer. Um, they have prepared their sewer facilities planning module. The planning commission chairman did sign that uh, as part of my recommendation. That will go forward now for this. Um, there are six final plan requirement comments that are procedural in nature relative to preparing your construction cost estimate for financial security thanks to all your agreements. Identification of the four waivers. Um, not a whole lot in the, the subdivision and land development. Noting that it's a, a real significant um, so, uh, if I may, I, so I, I got it. There are not major items, those 53. Uh, now, I don't know if it is realistic or not, as far as I'm concerned, at least. If you would consider eliminating lot 18 I, and realigning the lots around the cul de sac and put in another lot among them, make the 18 around the cul de sac, I understand the front line. Uh, the uh, you know will be a little smaller and so on. Yeah. That's in my opinion would be a, a great gift. Does the planning commission want me to go back to the twenty seven lot plan? You approved it, fully approved. Yeah, it was it had another lots. another we didn't, road in we there. Didn't touch lot eighteen. Eighteen was left as open space. Is that what the planning commission wants? It doesn't matter. I'm I'm talking in particular this lot eighteen with what it has. It is such a pity to take it out. That's what I'm saying. I did not object to your 27 lots the other time. So just my own opinion. If, if you are willing to try that, and I don't know what variances or waivers you will need for, to do that. My own idea, that's all. I wasn't part of the commission, the committee, when this originally came through. I just came in in January. So please forgive me for kind of going back in history a little bit. When it was 27 lots, you're saying lot 18 was not going to be used. That was going to be open space. That's right. Okay. When it was 13 lots, the area where lot 18 is, what was that going to be? That was open. That was still open. Okay. I struggle a little bit, Mr. Nolan, with the way lot 18 is set up from the perspective of someone who's going to come in and potentially look at that lot um, because there is the basin in the back. And I was trying to calculate the distance between side, I think it's the side of the house because the, the driveway for that lot is off of Wayland Road. Am I right on that? And then you have the basin in the back and looking at the size of the house. And again, thinking about the demographic who's going to buy the homes there, right? And it's likely to be families and looking at them using the backyard, the front yard, the side yard, and just if I were looking at the subdivision, I don't know that I would look at that lot because I would look at it and say, I'm going to constantly be chasing my kids out of that basin. So it wouldn't work, right? Unless maybe at what point would they even know that the basin was going to be there? But I don't want to get in the weeds too far. So that's that's one of the perspectives that I was thinking about as it relates to that lot. But also, I would like to understand a little bit better that the wetlands delineation has been defined the way it should be defined, right, appropriately, so we know a little bit better. I'm not sure, sir, that I have enough information right now to be able to say that that's been done. On your note, that's what I was asking earlier, as the, let's say it were to move forward, and does the planning or does the Board of Supervisors require that as a part of final approval, a more certified, up-to-date wetlands analysis. And if, let's say, that wetlands analysis came back as 
no, we don't agree with the 84 material. If you got to change your plan. Further analysis on the wetland, you can make that a condition of this approval for the board to confirm. Okay. Could it be at the discretion of the board to select that analysis person who does the analysis? Yes, it can, right? Uh, no, wait, wait, Go ahead. I, I, I don't know if I, I'd have a somewhat issue with having the township picking who's going to do the wetland expert. I could certainly say it, it seems like that's the way we're going. We'll get it recertified, but um, I, I don't know. I, I think we reject a little bit. Um, uh, well, I understand where you're coming from, and I agree with you. Okay. The point is it was brought to the table to be discredited, right, wrong, or indifferent, mm -hmm. because it was 1984. Then we had somebody bring a comment. We checked on the website. We don't see that anybody was licensed. I don't know about all that. I'm not gonna unpack that issue. It just seems like there's an issue of credibility around the wetlands analysis. And I was bringing that to the table to provide real strong clarity that the wetlands analysis is accurate or not. Oh. Uh, I yeah, think we have to rely on the professional to provide the professional services and, and design. That's my point. So if I, I would think that they have their own uh, wetland expert license and so on, and even if not, there are companies who do that. They Fair can subcontract a, uh, a company that does this thing, uh, flag the, the wetlands. They have a survey crew. They can shoot the flags. That's not the problem. I was speaking to, to the needs of the residents. Let, let me just let me just say this that according to the township's comprehensive plan, which is what this commission is required to rely upon, the 2016 comprehensive plans clearly states that Newtown Township ordinances provide little to no added protection for wetlands, leaving them vulnerable to disturbance and high de degradation, which can have adverse impacts on exactly what all the people here have said. We, as a commission, cannot go beyond our authority. We can enforce the ordinances of the township. Wetlands are defined under the, under, by the DEP, not, not by township ordinances. So they have to get DEP approval and, and to do this development. And they're the people. That's why we don't, nobody knows anything about that because yeah. that's beyond our purview. That's yeah. just beyond our purview. And so... Asking the questions, while well, they're all good questions, I appreciate that. I'm not certain it's our business to be in the wetlands. We're muddying, we're muddying the wetlands, which we shouldn't. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I, I think I disagree with that. I think um, having the riparian buffer is within our purview. And in order to establish a riparian buffer, you need to uh, establish where the wetlands are. Their plan has stated, as a matter of fact, the wetlands delineation was done in 1984. I don't believe that there existed standards by which that was done until 1987 and then amended in, in the 2000s. So I, um, I agree with the comprehensive plan that we don't have adequate protection for the wetlands in place. But when you're faced with a situation where you know that the delineation could, could not have possibly complied with the current standards for wetlands delineation because they didn't exist at the time, I feel an obligation to raise that as a legitimate issue. Anything else? The other thing that I would say is that um, I, I kind of object to saying that uh, the wetlands done in 84 are as as your kind of categorize them are useless because they don't meet up the sky. I, I disagree with that. I I, I understand that the um, the, the criteria has changed a little bit, but um, you know we came to the point where we understand those wetlands were um, there for a while and delineated a while ago. There was no development in this area, and then we came to the board thinking that we were going to need some verification, and that's what we did. Now, if the board is saying that we need more uh, verification, I understand where you're coming from, but we did comply with that. So if, you, if, if there's an additional uh, requirement, then, you know, by ordinance, what is it? Because as you said, this is going to DEP. And DEP looks at all of this stuff. 
does DEP weigh in on this subject? My guess is DEP will say, um, prove it's delineated. They would accept this and then make sure there's a proper uh, uh, buffer, which I believe will still be 50 feet because there's not a, there's not a, 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 a direct stream in there. If it was a stream it, it, or if it's like that, down the bottom, we have to provide 150 foot buffer because it's a, it's a wetland, um, a forest. It's that, a high quality one. High, well, well that, yeah, it's it's not so much that, it's that there's a defined stream there. So the buffers increase and then there's a forest in, uh, uh, um, riparian buffer. So that gets a little bit bigger. But they, DEP has looked at these wetlands and they're still looking at them. They're reviewing them as part of the MPDS. And they've looked at the ones that in, the, in the back. Um, and we've had conversations with the DEP on the, on the ones in the back. Um, I don't think they're looking at this in the, in the front and saying, you're not, you're not touching it, you're not impacting it, you're not coming near that. So at the very best, they'll say, make sure you have a repairing buffer, which is what uh, Mr. Porter asked us to put on a plan. And, and the township uh, repairing buffer for wetlands is 50 feet. And yes, we acknowledge our basin is encroaching on that. And yes, we acknowledge that we will we will change that. We will we revise that. To, you will have the township required 50 foot buffer from the wellings. How about certification, additional certification by somebody else or give up lot 18? Well, that, that's a kind of uh, <laughs> that's, uh, Would that help? Well, I, I, I mean, why the resistance to doing the certification? Um, well, it's because I, I, I'm spending my client's uh, money when I kind of already did. How much, money is, this, lot eight, how much money is lot 18? I, I don't know. I personally do not have objection if that's what if that's what needs to resolve 18. I'm just trying to throw Understood. anything at the wall. Understood. Understood. Would we get a preliminary final recommended approval with the stipulation that we certify the wetlands again. And as long as they're, uh, as long as we do not disturb within the 50 foot um, repair buffer, can we get that? Let me hold that for a second. Then it goes to DEP. DEP signs off and sort of looks at that, correct? And final board of supervisors have to approve as well based upon our approval. So they could turn it down at the Board of Supervisors. Or request changes. Or request changes right. or amendments at that time if the, at the elected board. Right. If the DEP finds some inconsistencies, they would have to come along the way or if there's a certification issue that presents itself along the process, right? That's, I just want to know that. That's kind of how that could go. I'm, I'm, I'll say I'm more agreeable to that than what I thought about earlier in the meeting. Normally, the division between uh, preliminary plan approval and final plan approval yep. is exactly for that situation where you have other agencies reviewing and approving in the process, like DP for the NPDS or an additional certification. Well, yeah, but uh, so I wouldn't have a problem, for example, uh, recommending preliminary approval for this. And then they would go and get all the other approvals, Agreed. including the NPDS, and the NPDS will have its own uh, revisions required. DP will require some revisions. And then they'll have to come back to us and then the supervisors for uh, the revised plan per DP and then we would recommend final approval and um, and uh, the, the board of supervisors would approve that. Yep. Now they are asking for a waiver to join the two approvals um, as required by the code from two make it one. And uh, well, concurrent approval. Well, yeah, yeah. it's the same time. Yeah. So I think this is exactly the situation where I would be more comfortable providing uh, recommending preliminary approval. Ask them to come back for final. By that time, all the uh, the questions about the wetlands, buffers, and all that would be answered by the piece of you. Can I, can I ask if we were to uh, 
I'm focused on the sidewalk on Wayland Road, which is shown on the plan. What what the thinking you're you're thinking on the sidewalk? You you think it's not necessary? I don't think it's necessary either. Yeah, I don't it's think it's necessary. Between either. nowhere to nowhere, well, it's it's a very common situation. Yeah. So if it's a waste of money. Well, the but money, procedurally, if we agree that the sidewalk can go away, well, he would still have to put money in new or whatever. But uh, but uh, well, that, there's no point. Does, does it have a ripple effect on the plan? And that you take out the sidewalk, does that then change the tree profiles? It does. And what you're and leaving in, taking out, then you have to revise the plan. Or or do you do we say that's okay to do subject to the engineer's approval? Well, the engineer would have to review anyhow. Well, yeah, but I mean, in terms of an approval, I think I see what you're saying. Hey, if we take the sidewalks out, are they coming back anyway? No. Yeah, I mean, no. to me, the idea of a preliminary approval where you have your vested rights in the project, subject to all these changes, does make sense given where we are. The, the applicant has to make that decision. Right. Preliminary, you will have to make that decision. We can say, we can of discuss the case, but yeah. we can't make that decision. The no. applicant would have to say, no, correct. I would rather, I would rather stick with the preliminary final. The only reason why, hear me out, Shimon. The only reason why is if we get preliminary approval, okay, and we come back and we approve wetlands fine, DEP's fine, we're just going to go through this process again. And we're going to have more people come up and we're going to have people object and there will be something else. So what, what I'd rather do, I, I, I want to have the, I, I would, we would like to request the waiver preliminary file. But if the, if the planning commission isn't going to give us that, then I'd rather wait and delay this a month, come back with hopefully certified that, that satisfies you with the wetlands, still get the, um, uh, the waiver for preliminary file. Because all of, all that does with preliminary means we have to come back to several more meetings and it's several more months um, for an issue that could be resolved pretty simply. Well, I understand your point exactly. Okay. So uh, the certification of the wetlands for me, if you came back with that, um, I would be satisfied. And verify that. Uh, I don't know how you will verify that this is the uh, issue of the um, high quality uh, watershed doesn't apply as far as buffer is concerned. Because my concern is that you may be required to uh, increase the buffer size. As of now, 50, 50 foot is all we're required. As of now, DEP has not said you have to increase your, your buffer. They may, because like I said, they're still reviewing from the MPP, MPDS, but I don't think the fact that it's either a wetland uh, um, is going to change that, you know, to me, it's always been there's a wetland, there's a buffer, there's a stream and a wetland, there's a buffer, there's a forest stream and a, and a wetland, there's a buffer. That's how they do it. I don't think they're going to, uh, um, I don't think they're going to ask for more buffer in this area, but that, but that's fine. But, but, but um, if we then get a certification next next month and then you can put the condition on on the approval that it's up to DEP and if DEP changes their mind and we have to come in for changes then we come in for changes. I would like to to do a a wetland study rather than just another letter. Well cert a certification that complies with the current standards. Well without surveying the wetlands? Oh, no, they have to. They, well, to they certify, order, they got to go look at it. They, well, they have to establish. I mean, the standards are very specific. They got to look at the hydrology, the plant life, and something else. And, and the soil. And yes. the soil. So. I don't know what I think. Yeah. And then to do, yes, to do a wetland delineation. Yeah, a, a real wetlands delineation in accordance with the. By the Westward Board. So that it shows them where they did the soil samples, what species they evaluated. This is what they have. Yeah. Yes. And field survey, the supply location of the wetlands. Yeah, I mean, that's what you're playing. Everything they've said will be said. Sounds good to me. I would feel a lot better All right. about that. So basically, you will come back and uh, after 
We'll even submit the, plans based on uh, Dave's review letter too. Well, we'll we'll clean up the plans uh, before helpful, the new yeah. one. We'll, we'll take yeah. care of that. If the fifty-five lens could go yep. down a little right. bit, that would be fantastic. Yep. And you'll decide what you want to do about the sidewalk. Uh, we uh, he already we, said that yeah, we, 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 I don't think the sidewalks crush me either way. You know, I, would it, can you make the argument? Yes, I agree. Can you make the argument? No, this is I not agree. Make this is not going to make the difference here. Totally agree. And I've driven down Wayland Road. I've driven the site. I haven't walked it, but I've I've been there. Okay, so you, you've been on site. No, I didn't walk on it. It's your property. I'm not going to. But <laughs> if you're okay with that, I will. What you walking on site? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Right. So what we'll do is we'll we'll, we'll come back next week. Um, next we, week. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Next month. <laughs> um, are we okay with um, the uh, extension? If you consent, one? we're okay. Well, your application your work was January 31st. Right. You submitted in January. Right. right. So you appeared here on February 23rd. Right. Okay. Now we're 30 days out. So I think we're still good. Okay. If you'd like to give us an extension for an additional 30 days, it wouldn't hurt. Well, um, when's the next meeting? The next meeting is next meeting will be April 27th. Yeah. But then after, then presuming the we approve, have they have to have their approval would, by the board. Right. Right. So the board would. Probably here again, they'd like to hear this at the second meeting of the month. So that's May 15th. Planning Commission meeting is the 22nd. Planning Commission is April 27th. That second so, board meeting would be May 27th. So they so would need they would need to grant an extension, extension at least until May 23rd. Okay. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send a letter to the township tomorrow requesting the extension. Now, one last thing, I know that there were some additional concerns. You want to put on the record that there should be some consideration given to street lights or some level of street light. You know, you brought that up, and then also maybe some recommendation to put a note on the plan to protect the additional trees that are planted on the private property. So we discussed that street lights were the Board of Supervisors' purview. Yeah, as far as protection of trees. You are welcome to put a note like that on the plan. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Jim. Good Don't have to stay there. Good night. I think so. Oh, I think it all All right. Um, so, item eight. We know what will be next on. Thank you. Meeting to adjourn. All right. Uh, nothing else. Um, motion to adjourn. Adjourn. The second. Second. Everybody say aye. 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 aye.